Okay, so welcome to this next part of the video on uh, gabapentinoids and uh, epilepsy. Okay, so now we've discussed what epilepsy is, uh, let's finally discuss what the gabapentinoids are and a possible mechanism by which they, uh, a possible suggestion almost of um, how they might work because they are not understood, they're not well understood. So firstly, let's understand their relation to the amino acid GABA. So the amino acid GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, um, which stands for gamma amino butyric acid, so gamma uh, amino, probably like this, amino butyric acid, oh dear, whoops, butyric acid. Uh, this butyric acid is just an old name for butanoic acid, so let's draw butanoic acid like so. So butanoic acid is a four-carbon four carbon, uh, carboxylic acid, and then we've got gamma amino, so we've got an amino group on the gamma carbon. Now gamma carbon of an acid like this uh, means this third carbon, because this is referred to as the alpha carbon, this is referred to as the beta carbon, and this is referred to as the gamma carbon. So the first carbon after the carboxyl group is known as the alpha carbon in a carboxylic acid, then beta, and then gamma, etc. So when people write gamma amino butyric acid, what they actually mean is uh, effectively 4-amino butyric acid or 4-amino butanoic acid in modern nomenclature. Okay, so then just put hydrogens everywhere else and you've got the structure of GABA. Okay, so that is the structure of gamma amino butyric acid. Now the structure of the GABA pentanoids, of which there are two main ones, which is firstly GABA pentin and the second one is uh, pregabalin. Uh, these, the structure of these two molecules is highly based on the structure of GABA here, which is why they're called GABA pentanoids. Okay, uh, why, well, why their names involve GABA so much, pre-GABA then and GABA pentin. Okay, so GABA pentin uh, has the structure, it basically has the exact same structure as uh, GABA, so we'll draw that out. So here comes the structure of GABA, except that it has something attached. Um, or instead of having two hydrogens attached to this middle one, it instead has two carbons attached. And instead it has a uh, carbon ring, basically. So you have two carbons attached like this. And then you have more carbons, basically, like this, to make up a six-membered ring. So a, hex, a hexane ring is effectively attached into it. So then just saturate all these other carbons with hydrogen atoms. And that is the structure of gabapentin, basically. So it has a structure highly analogous to the structure of GABA. Pregaba then has a slightly simpler structure. Oh dear, there should be a hydrogen on that. I mean, uh, nitrogen. So again, it's based on the structure of GABA, so we'll draw out GABA again. Uh, but this time, rather than having a um, a, um, hexa a cyclohexane ring here um, uh, joined onto the um, middle carbon. Instead what you have is you have this group attached to the middle carbon. So I'll just finish off the hydrogens here. You have another hydrogen there, another hydrogen there. So again you attach a group onto this middle carbon and basically the group you attach is similar to um, is similar to an amino acid side group actually. Um, and you have um, Basically, you have this ethyl group with two methyl groups on the end. Or uh, So this basically has a very similar structure to the amino acid isoleucine. Uh, so isoleucine is an amino acid with effectively the same uh, R group here uh, attached to it in the R position. Okay, uh, so that's the structure of pregaba then, that you have this... Um, this uh, ethyl group with then effectively two methyl groups, or a propyl group if you prefer to view it like that, uh, with a methyl group attached to the middle carbon of the propyl group. Okay, uh, so it was originally thought that maybe both of these structures, uh, both of these structures were agonists for GABA, uh, for GABA receptors, i.e. that they would achieve their effect uh, by doing something similar to GABA. And GABA basically is an inhibitory amino acid, uh, an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. It's a really important inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So um, it was thought, you know, that if we put these drugs in, they were going to have an inhibitory effect, and maybe they could inhibit uh, the, um, uh, the epileptogenic focus, basically, from firing. Okay, it's now thought that that is not how they work. Uh, instead, it is believed that they, um, well, what is known is that they interact with the alpha-2 delta subunit of voltage-gated calcium channels. And basically, they stop 
um, they, they, they interfere with it, they stop it working basically, they bind to the alpha-2 delta subunit and they stop it working, so both of these drugs inhibit this alpha-2 delta subunit. And if the alpha-2 delta subunit is not working, then what were the two things we overall concluded the alpha-2 delta subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel does? It is responsible for taking the alpha-1 subunits to the um, so remember let me just do a bit a bit of a summary of alpha two delta's properties so if this is a neuron here okay then there are voltage gated calcium channels in the axon terminal over here so there are two t main types of voltage gated calcium channels that are really important in the axon terminal for the release of neurotransmitter namely the PQ type or CAV two point one. CAV 2.1, and also the N-type, or CAV 2.2, okay, uh, and in both of these cases, in order to, the, these, these, um, these names here, the PQ type and the N-type, that tells you what the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel is, so remember, if we just revise again the structure of the voltage-gated calcium channel, the main subunit is this alpha-1 subunit, which is the uh, subunit which actually allows the calcium to, fl uh, to move across the membrane. So it has these four domains which make a pore in the middle. But you also have auxiliary subunits, for instance, the gamma subunit, the beta subunit, and the alpha-2 delta subunit. Here's the delta bit and here's the alpha-2 bit linked by a disulfide bond. Okay. Right, so um, that's, that, that's the overall structure of the uh, voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, the, the, these names here, they refer to the type of alpha-1 subunit you're uh, using. So you use these two types of alpha-1 subunits. But basically, how do you get this alpha-1 subunit from the soma to the axon terminal? Well, the alpha-2 delta subunit is absolutely essential for doing that. It basically traffics the alpha-1 subunits to the axon terminal. In addition, the alpha-2 delta subunit, once you actually get to the axon terminal, the alpha-2 delta subunit is involved in making sure that the alpha-1 subunit is positioned, i.e. the overall voltage-gated calcium channel is positioned nearby um, docked vesicles, basically. So it binds with uh, proteins that are involved in docking vesicles, and that ensures that the voltage-gated calcium channel is neighbouring, is, is right next to uh, the uh, bound vesicles, the docked vesicles that are ready to be released, so that when uh, an action potential happens, these voltage-gated calcium channels can open, and the calcium is therefore uh, right next to this vesicle and can cause it to fuse. So the alpha-2 delta subunit has two roles. Firstly, firstly in making sure that the alpha-1 subunit actually gets to the axon terminal, and then in making sure that the uh, voltage that you know the alpha one subunit is actually bound nearby a docked vesicle. Okay, so uh, if you inhibit this alpha two delta subunit, what's going to happen is that you're going to get less alpha one subunits uh, of these voltage gated calcium channels in the axon terminal, and secondly, they're not going to actually be bound to the vesicles, so it's going to majorly inhibit neurotransmission, and that is thought to maybe underlie. It's anti Both of these drugs are extremely potent anti-epileptics, just in case I didn't say that maybe at some point. That's what these two drugs are used for. They are used as anti-convulsant slash anti-epileptic.